Welcome to episode 61 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. In this episode, we get to speak to retired agent John Hershley, who served in the FBI for 30 years, and retired agent Larry Tungate, who served for 29. They were case agents and investigators of the April 19, 1995 bombing of the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City. They are interviewed about the fast-moving search to identify, capture, and charge the persons responsible for the bombing. John Hershley was assigned to the Oklahoma City Division of the FBI, and Larry Tungate was in the Bureau's Kansas City office. They tell us what was happening in their respective offices and leads that were being sent all over the country in those initial days right after the bombing. A bomb blast that caused the death of 168 innocent people, including 19 children. It also destroyed the entire north side of the nine-story concrete and granite Murrow building, incinerated nearby cars, and damaged more than 300 buildings in the area. The Oak Bomb investigation, as it became known, is the United States' deadliest act of homegrown terrorism. After being tried and convicted of the crime, Timothy McVeigh was executed on June 11, 2001, and Terry Nichols was sentenced to life in prison. A third individual, Michael Fortier, was sentenced to 12 years in prison for failing to report the planned attack and for lying to the FBI. In their book, Simple Truths, the real story of the Oklahoma City bombing investigation, John Hershley and Larry Tungate, and their co-author, Bob Burke, assembled a chronological review of the initial events and of the evidence gathered in the case against McVeigh, Nichols, and Fortier. I wasn't sure how it would turn out interviewing two people at the same time, But Larry and John know their case so well and know their respective roles so well that it really is a fascinating interview. I do want to get to that right away, but just a few things I wanted to tell you. Our old friend, Max Knoll, who told us all about the investigation of the Unabomber, will be on TV talking about the case. He was interviewed for the new primetime series, How It Really Happened with Bill Harper on the HLN Network. That show will air on Friday, April 7th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I also wanted to let you know that starting on April 1st, I will be introducing my FBI Reading Resource, which is a comprehensive list of all of the crime fiction, true crime books, and memoirs that I've introduced to you in past episodes of FBI Retired Case File Review. These are the great books about the FBI written by the retired FBI agents featured on this podcast. This reading resource is an easy to update link that will be available in the free stuff section of every newsletter. So if you're interested in checking out those books, all you need to do is sign up for my newsletter at Jerry Williams, J-E-R-R-I, jerrywilliams.com. Of course, one of the books on that FBI reading resource is my FBI thriller, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. Pay to Play currently has 56, mostly five-star reviews. Thank you to all of the listeners who have purchased, read, and reviewed the novel. When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or as a gift for someone you know loves crime fiction, you're helping me to continue to produce ad-free content on a weekly basis. Plus, as you can tell from the great reviews, Pay to Play is a good read. So keep the reviews, tweets, posts, and emails coming. I love hearing about how the interviews with retired agents inspire, encourage, and educate you about the FBI. Thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest today, 
John Hursley, and Larry Tungate. Hi, guys. Hi. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning. Well, you know, normally we do an interview where I'm asking questions and, and kind of conversing with my guests, but you guys are used to doing this presentation together. You know, you both had uh, roles in the investigation of the Oklahoma City bombing. You have PowerPoint presentations, which, of course, we won't be able to see. And it just makes sense, I think, in this case, for me to kind of sit back and, with the rest of the listeners, just enjoy the show. So I'm going to let you guys start, and, you know, I'll, I'll only jump in if I have a question that I think the listeners, you know, would like to get an answer for. You know, tell us when this all started and the first that you were aware of it. Okay. Um, on on the morning of the bombing, uh, which was April the 19th of 1995, uh, I was assigned to the Oklahoma City uh, office of the FBI. <clears throat> Our office was located about three miles to the north, a little bit northwest of the downtown Oklahoma City area. I remember at about 9 o'clock in the morning um, feeling... Uh, um, uh, and what turned out to be an explosion, you could actually feel it from our building. We had the top three floors of a commercial building uh, where our offices uh, about three miles, as I say, from downtown Oklahoma City, and you could feel the bomb blast when it occurred. So I remember I was up on the uh, 16th floor, and I went over and looked out the window, as did a bunch of the other agents and the support staff and employees, and you could see smoke billowing up from the downtown uh uh, Oklahoma City area is real dark gray, almost black smoke, uh, just billowing up in the downtown Oklahoma City area. And so we all wondered what was going on. Our initial thoughts were that some kind of accidental explosion or maybe some planned explosion or dropping of a building had, had been planned that morning in downtown Oklahoma City. But uh, we felt like we better get down to that area pretty quickly and see what this was all about. So agents uh, started almost immediately heading to the downtown Oklahoma City area. And it wasn't long uh, before some of the agents started arriving, and we learned that it was the uh, Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building that had blown up in downtown Oklahoma City. The bomb blast was so strong that it blew the entire face or facade of the of the Murrah Building away. It was a nine-story building, and and all uh, the the whole front side of the nine stories had been blown off the face of the building. It it looked like a literally like a war zone when we got down there. And I remember thinking to myself when I arrived downtown Oklahoma City, thinking who could do such a thing as this? That there could be so much hatred inside of somebody that they could do something like this. But it literally looked like a a war zone when we got down there. And we had agents. Uh, what we did was went about trying to get a command post set up down there so that we could start uh, cordoning off the area and, and uh, dividing it up into search quadrants so we could start uh, having search teams as they arrived assigned to uh, start searching the area to see what we could find, if there was any uh, remnants of the bomb or what we could find out. So that's what we did, and it wasn't long um, before we did find a um, – piece of what turned out to be the Ryder bomb truck that was uh, a block and a half away to the west on Northwest 5th Street, and it was was what turned out to be the rear uh, axle assembly to the the Ryder bomb truck. And I remember there being a partial vehicle identification number on that um, rear axle assembly that was PVA26077. I'll never forget that number, I don't think, as long as I'm still alive. So we knew when we saw that rear axle assembly that that was likely going to be a piece of the bomb truck because when when a bomb like this happens, you don't normally see it blow cars that are in surrounding in the surrounding area to pieces like this uh, truck had been blown up. So we felt like with this piece being blown a block and a half away from the what turned out to be the actual bomb site, that there was a good chance that it was a piece of what would would turn out to be the actual bomb vehicle, and that's exactly what happened. 
Yeah, yeah, this is Larry Tungate. I, I was a little bit different than John in that I was at that time assigned to the Kansas City, Missouri FBI field office, and uh, and I was at the U.S. Attorney's office at, for a 9 a.m. meeting, pre-trial meeting uh, there in Kansas City when someone came in and, and turned on the TV and told us that uh, there had been a, a bomb that had gone off in uh, in Oklahoma City. Uh, you know, this was some minutes afterwards and they were already speculating at the time that it was uh that it was a bomb that it was uh you know all sorts of theories were coming out as to who might have planted this bomb and uh who the guilty parties were well as as you know Jerry uh there were because of the magnitude of this uh explosion and and, and the developments that occurred uh Command posts were set up in every field office across the United States and around the world uh, were put on alert and uh, began going into uh, a, a very uh, pronounced uh, set of protocols for following leads that would uh, emanate from this explosion. And uh, it wasn't long before the Kansas City office, which covered half the state of Missouri and all the state of Kansas, became very involved uh, in the investigation. I think John can tell you how that led up to uh, to Kansas uh, becoming involved in, in the matter. Yes, uh, Jerry. As we, as I mentioned, we had uh, agents arriving very rapidly into the downtown Oklahoma City area after the bombing. We also had agents uh, that were starting to plan to come into Oklahoma City from other divisions as well very rapidly that morning uh, because of the, the uh, carnage and the sight of, of what had occurred in downtown Oklahoma City. So what we did was we divided uh, the search area around the Murrah building into, into different quadrants and then assigned search teams to start looking for any type of evidence that, the, that they might come up with uh, and we cordoned off the whole area uh, around the Murrah building for quite a ways out so that we could uh, keep people from coming in to what would turn out to be a horrid uh, crime scene. Uh, one of the things that we found early on, as I mentioned, was this rear axle assembly, and, and there was a what we call a partial vehicle identification number, that PVA 26077 that was on that rear axle assembly. And and we knew from uh, vehicle stolen vehicle investigations that vehicles have partial identification numbers on them, and if you can find a, a part of that uh, vehicle that has one of those numbers on it, you can trace it back through the National Insurance Crime Bureau, uh, which coincidentally I work for today. Uh, but that's what we did. Once we got that partial vehicle identification number, we got a hold of the National Insurance Crime Bureau, one of our agents, Jim Elliott, who was assigned to the McAllister, uh, Oklahoma resident agency, had worked a lot with the National Insurance Crime Bureau over the years. And so he made a call to them and asked them if they could help us identify which vehicle that rear axle assembly belonged to based on that partial vehicle identification number. And it was uh, very quickly identified as being a 1993 Ford truck. Uh, so we uh, had agents uh, contact Ford, Ford Motor Company. Uh, that's one of the nice things about the FBI is that we've got offices all across the United States, and so we can very quickly, when we need to, get leads covered, uh, you know, very quickly. And so we had agents contact Ford Motor Company and find out about this particular 1993 Ford uh, truck that had been manufactured. We wanted to know everything we could find out about it, and it wasn't long before we found out that the, it was manufactured by Ford and that it was actually sold to Ryder Truck Rentals in Miami, Florida. All of this, Jerry, was going on very early uh, uh, around 11 o'clock in the morning on the morning of the bombing, uh, Wednesday morning, so you can see how quickly this was starting to develop. Let me ask you a question. You might have already said this, and I missed it. How soon after the bombing, after you arrived there, did you find this axle? About an hour and a half. Wow. <clears throat> Between around 10.30 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Once we found out that Ford Motor Company had sold the uh, the truck to Ryder Truck Rentals in Miami, Florida, of course, we had agents respond to Ryder Truck Rentals in Miami, Florida, to find out, you know, what, where this truck was, see what we could find out about it, where it might have last been dispatched out of because it was a rental truck 
And, of course, uh, Ryder Truck Rentals uh, stopped everything and identified for us that this truck had last been rented from uh, Elliott's Body Shop in Junction City, Kansas. And so the next thing we wanted to do was get agents out to uh, Junction City, Kansas, and talk to people at Elliott's Body Shop to find out what we could about who had last rented this truck. And, Larry, you might want to talk a little bit about that. Yes, this is when the Kansas City office really became involved uh, in in the uh, whole investigation. Because, as John had said, it was about an hour and a half or, or so uh, when they identified the rear axle, and it took another couple hours to, to run it down. And then we learned that the truck had been rented uh, on uh, April 17th, 1995, at Elliott's Body Shop in Junction City. So the Kansas City Division immediately uh, sent out an agent the closest agent uh, from a resident agency, uh, the FBI, as you know, Jerry, has uh, a field division and it has smaller offices that, uh, with uh, fewer agents that control around a, not just a metropolitan area, but also out in the country and across statewide. The resident agent agency that was closest to Junction City was the Salina, Kansas RA, and we had it was, it was a single uh, manned agency, and Scott Crabtree was uh, dispatched from Salina, Kansas to Junction City, which was about an hour away. At that time, he was he was notified by the Miami uh, agents uh, as to about you know to go there secure the documents interview anyone that might have seen or participated in the rental of this vehicle so that's what he did now he, he on in his route there he he phoned the uh, uh, Elliot's Body Shop and asked them you know to to maintain the paperwork for that particular rental. I think uh, Ryder Truck Rentals had probably also contacted uh, those individuals to alert them that the FBI was interested in this particular rental. But uh, he asked that you know no one talk about it. So when he got there, he interviewed uh, three folks primarily, uh, the owner of, of the body shop, Eldon Elliott, uh, uh, one of his employees, Vicki Beamer, and another uh, gentleman that worked in the body shop portion of Elliott's body shop, and that was t- uh, Tom Kessinger. So we interviewed these individuals, and he obtained the the paperwork for the rental of this particular rider truck, and showed that it had been rented by a a Robert Kling, and that it had been picked up on Monday, uh, April the seventeenth, and coincidentally, it had a time of pickup as four nineteen, uh, which is uh, obviously the same day uh, of the uh, of the bombing. Hmm. Uh, so, Agent Crabtree was in constant contact with not only Oklahoma City but Kansas City and FBI headquarters regarding uh, this uh, this truck, and uh, based on his interviews, it was determined that. Tom Kessinger perhaps had the best view of re- recollection of what this gentleman looked like that picked up this rider. Now, initially, uh, Eldon Elliott described one individual, but after talking with uh, Beamer and Kessinger and, and, and the group, I believe that there might have been two uh, unsubs that had been involved in the uh, rental of this rider truck. So... Uh, the FBI headquarters flew out a uh, forensic artist, uh, Ray Rosicki, to sit down uh, with uh, Tom Kessinger because he had the best recall. And in the early morning hours uh, of uh, now into April the 20th, uh, the artist sat down with Tom Kessinger and basically came up with two uh, sketches of what was known and is known as John Doe 1 and John Doe 2. Now, that presented a, quite a dilemma that John might be able to tell you about the, uh, the, the wranglings at the uh, command post in Oklahoma City about what to do with these uh, sketches. Well, yeah, Jerry, what we did as things were starting to develop in the Kansas City Division up in the, in the Junction City, Kansas area, of course, we were continuing our uh, scouring in search of the area uh, immediately surrounding the Murrah building, and we came up with other uh, parts of what turned out to be the uh, parts of the Ryder uh, bomb truck as well, such as the Florida license plate uh, NEE26R, 
uh, was found, it was still mangled around the rear um, bumper of the vehicle, and it was found in front of the uh, water resources building. So once we found out this license plate was had been blown completely off of the vehicle and it was mangled in this kind of manner, uh, we started feeling like um, the bomb experts did anyway, that there might have been some possibility of an ammonium nitrate bomb that caused this explosion because of the nature of how the some of the parts that we were finding. And we found five of the uh, six wheel hubs as well. We found other pieces of the what turned out to be the Ryder bomb truck, the frame rail, uh, was embedded in a van that was across the street to the north from the Murray building. We found another piece of the bomb truck that was on top of a four-story building. So we were starting to realize that this was no accident, that this was actually a, a bomb blast, and, in, and it was entirely possible that it was going to be an ammonium nitrate bomb. So we found many pieces of the vehicle. Uh, another component of the vehicle that we found was the uh, the key, the actual key to what turned out to be the bomb truck that was located behind the YMCA building, which was to the northeast about a block away from the Murrah building. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in addition to scouring the area for uh, evidence, we also began conducting interviews in the downtown Oklahoma City area uh, to try to find out if anybody had seen anything in the, you know, the immediate time before the bombing or maybe right after the bombing. And so there was one person that was interviewed uh, that said, yes, I saw uh, what looked like two Middle Easterners run across the street from in front of the Murrah building across Northwest 5th Street and jump into a brown Chevrolet truck and take off uh, to the west and then turn uh, to the north on Hudson Street. Well, uh, we had some decisions to make at that point because we certainly wanted to try to catch these people uh, before anything further happened. We were concerned about whether or not other buildings were being planned to be blown up that morning or in the days following as well. So we had to decide whether or not to put out APBs for the brown Chevy truck, whether to put out broadcasts about the two supposed Middle Easterners that this witness uh, said they had seen, even though there were problems in the descriptions uh, that they provided and that they said it was just minutes after the bombing, or I'm sorry, minutes before the bombing, that they saw these two Middle Easterners run across the street. They described them very well, said they had on black kind of trench coats, uh, uh, dark blue jeans, white shirts. So there was a big question about why they would be noticing these people so much before mm-hmm. anything happened. And then other things were inconsistent as well in that uh, Northwest uh, 5th Street is a one-way street to the east, and they said they jumped into the brown Chevy pickup and went to the west, turned north of Hudson, which is the one-way to the south. Now, who is this witness? It was just somebody that happened to be in the downtown uh, Oklahoma City area in the immediate aftermath of the bombing that provided uh, these descriptions to us. And so we had to decide at that point in time whether we wanted to go ahead and release that information to the news media, and we eventually decided that that was the best course of action. And, of course, I think that's what impacted the witnesses at Elliott's Body Shop in that the news media was now broadcasting that there were two Middle Easterners that that were running away from the Murrah building right before the bomb blast. So... As Larry said, uh, Ellen Elliott, when he was first interviewed, said that he only described one person that came in and rented the Ryder truck. But then after these broadcasts started coming out, that's when it started becoming two people that went into Elliott's body shop instead of one. Jerry, this is uh, Larry again, John, if I can jump in here. I might add that these kind of leads and this kind of information was just flowing to pretty much every field office in the United States. Uh, I mean, literally thousands of leads and phone calls and tips came in uh, to a number of, uh, of field offices, you know, immediately after and for weeks after uh, the bombing, uh, the bombing case. Now, back to the, the Kansas City thing, if I could jump in there and, and kind of take that to a, a little further along, uh, as John and, and his troops were doing that, Kansas City 
dispatched more agents to the Junction City area because it was pretty obvious that the uh, bomb truck uh, was rented there, so they wanted more help for Agent Crabtree, and a number of agents were dispatched there uh, early on the uh, on the morning of the uh, 20th uh, just to as- assist Scott Crabtree. One of the things that they did was dispatch agents around the Junction City area to see if anyone had noticed a rider truck or seen anything unusual with a rider truck in the last few days. At that time, it was still being debated whether to release these to the news media, the the, uh, the the sketches of John Doe 1 and John Doe 2, but agents had them with them, and they were going out to various loca- business locations in the Junction City areas. One of the locations was the Dreamland Motel, uh, and Agent Mark Bowden and a and a local Junction City police officer went and visited the owner of that motel, uh, Leah McGowan, and basically uh, Mr. Bowden asked asked her uh, had she seen a rider truck in the area uh, in the last couple of days or had been at her establishment, and she uh, indicated that indeed she had a rider truck that had been parked at her uh, at her motel on uh, on the 17th of uh, April which is the day that uh, that we Robert Kling had had rented uh, the rider truck from Elliot's body shop now uh, she indicated that the person that did this had stayed at her motel and had checked in on on Friday April the 14th uh, and, and provided she was a little suspicious of him because of the way he acted in the beat up car uh, that he was driving, which was a was which was a Mercury, uh, an older Mercury uh, that he was driving, a beater uh, type car, and uh, she put him in room 25, and he provided the name of Timothy McVeigh from Decker, Michigan. And uh, indicated that he showed up in the Mercury, but on the on the night of the 17th, she observed a rider truck parked in her in her motel establishment, and uh, and then later uh, he departed on the early morning hours of April the 18th, which is the day before uh, the bombing, and we have evidence as to what he did uh, later on in this. But this uh, proved to be uh, a very uh, key and pivotal early on in the investigation. There were many leads being covered across not only Kansas but obviously Oklahoma City and across the country. But this one had had some merit to it, and uh, Agent Bowden knew that uh, when he conducted it. At the very end of his uh, interview, he showed uh, Leah McGowan, the owner. Uh, the two composites of John Doe one and John Doe two. McGowan immediately says John Doe one. The sketch of John Doe one looked immediate. It looked exactly like Timothy McVeigh, or a strong resemblance to Timothy McVeigh, who stayed in her motel in room 25. She did not recognize uh, the sketch of John Doe two and was not familiar with her with uh, that person. So Mark Bowden returned to the command post, which we had the Kansas City office had set up at Fort Riley in an old World War II barracks at Fort Riley as more agents and support personnel were, were pour, pouring into that area to, uh, to uh, help with it. And Agent Bowden provided the command post with that information, which was immediately sent both to FBI HQ and Oklahoma City uh, as to what to do with with this information. And, John, you might want to add to that. Yeah, Jerry, as Larry was saying, uh, the composite artist, uh, Ray Rizicki, uh did com- did these two drawings based on the recollections of Tom Kessinger and the other witnesses at Elliott's Body Shop. And actually, when we found out that, uh, that Tim McVeigh uh, was involved in the bombing, turned out that the composite drawing that Ray Verzicki had done of him was a very good likeness of Tim McVeigh. Uh, we didn't know at that time uh, who Tim McVeigh was. We, we didn't know that he was the person for sure that was depicted in the drawing. We had no idea who the drawing was of John Doe number 2. But uh, as Larry said, once we found out from Liam McGowan that uh, Tim McVeigh had stayed at the hotel, at her hotel, the Dreamland Motel, in just outside of Junction City, Kansas there, in the days leading up to the bombing, and that he had brought a rider truck there, 
and that he looked very much like the composite drawing of John Doe number one. Obviously, we wanted to know everything we could find out about Tim McVeigh. Of course, at that point in time, we had no idea whether or not he was involved in the bombing, but we certainly wanted to find out everything we could about him. So what we did was we had uh, Agent Walt Lamar uh, contact FBI headquarters and ask them to do an offline NCIC search uh, so we could find out if any Tim McVeigh had been arrested in the days leading up to the Oklahoma City bombing. And that's where we really hit pay dirt. <clears throat> in that we found out that from the offline NCIC search that a Tim McVeigh had been arrested on the morning of the bombing uh, by uh, the Charlie Hanger, who was a state trooper in Oklahoma at the time. Uh, Charlie subsequently became the sheriff of Noble County, which is pretty interesting as well. Uh, but the, the game plan then was get a hold of uh, the state patrol there, find out what we could about the arrest of Tim McVeigh so we could we could learn as much as we could about him. So um, we had Agent Mark Mahalik from the ATF uh, call up to Noble County, uh, talk to Jerry Cook, because that's where we found out that uh, McVeigh had been arrested and booked into the Noble County Jail up there. And we wanted to find out if, uh, from Jerry if McVeigh was still in custody. Uh, when Mark got a hold of uh, Charlie Hanger, Charlie said, yeah, I arrested a Tim McVeigh that morning. Uh, <clears throat> at about 10:20 in the morning, and I charged him with some weapons offenses because he had a, a loaded uh, 45 and a shoulder holster on him. When I when I pulled him over, he said I pulled him over. He was driving an old 1977 uh, 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 Mercury Marquis, and he didn't have a license plate on it. <clears throat> Charlie, uh, like a lot of other law enforcement officers, had been dispatched to Oklahoma City that morning to help with the bombing. But on, en route down there, Charlie got a call from his dispatcher and said, Hey, Charlie, you're going to have to come back up and, and keep patrolling your area. We can't have everybody going down to Oklahoma City. So Charlie was a little disappointed at that point in time because he wanted to be involved, obviously, as did all of law enforcement in Oklahoma at the time. But anyway, Charlie had to turn back around and start heading back north away from Oklahoma City on I-35, and that's when he spotted the yellow mercury uh, without a license plate on it and decided to pull it over. And when he did, uh, he found out that it was Tim McVeigh inside. And so he got uh, Tim McVeigh out of the vehicle, and McVeigh, as he was talking to him, uh, Charlie noticed a, a bulge underneath his jacket, and he asked him what it was, and he said, well, I've got a gun on. So Charlie immediately grabbed a hold of him and spun him around and put him up on the car and uh, put his gun to his head, and McVeigh uh, said, my gun's loaded, and Charlie said, so is mine. So anyway, he ended up arresting McVeigh at that point in time for um, that weapons offense and um, and booked him into the Noble County Jail. So when Mahalik, Agent Mahalik from the ATF, got a hold of Jerry Cook, he asked him if McVeigh was still there, and Jerry said, well, I don't know. He had a court appearance this morning. I think he's probably already booked and bonded out. So uh, Mark asked him, he said, well, Jerry, would you run down there real quick and see if he's still there? And if he is, p please put a hold on him because uh, we want to talk to him about the Oklahoma City bombing. So Der Jerry did exactly that. And fortunately for us, there was a little bit of a miscue in the in the uh, person that was having a court appearance before McVeigh that delayed, his, delayed McVeigh's court appearance, and McVeigh was still in custody, which was really a, a, a bonanza for us. So Jerry did put a hold on him. Uh, Forest until we could get up there and pick him up. And Jerry and John, I, I might add at the at the same time this was going on, there was more work being done at the Dreamland Motel, and, and one of those things was that when McVeigh had uh, rented the uh, the unit, uh, it was uh, found out that he had provided a address in Decker, Michigan, and so agents from the Detroit division uh, were. Uh, dispatched to this Van Dyke address in Decker, Michigan, and they learned a lot, and they identified James and Terry Nichols, who resided there, and they found out some information that the Nichols brothers were farmers, but they had there had been some discussion about anti-government uh, views, and that these gentlemen had... Uh, experience with uh with bombs uh out in their fields and that sort of thing. Uh they did more investigation, found out that Terry Nichols had an ex wife in 
uh, Las Vegas and Nevada by the name of Lana Padilla, and agents were dispatched in the Las Vegas office to interview Lana Padilla, who provided some very uh, useful insight as to the activities of uh, Terry Nichols and his relationship with Tim McVeigh. She also provided information that Terry Nichols at that time was living in Harrington, Kansas, which was about uh, less than 30 miles from Junction City uh, where the Ryder truck had been rented. So uh, agents at this time were not only working on the Dreamland and Tim McVeigh, but trying to identify who Terry Nichols was, uh, what role he might have played, uh, if any. Uh, and uh, so it was all going on at the same time. There was a lot of uh, a lot of investigation happening by field offices all across the country, uh, all pointing back to the command post in Oklahoma City. Yeah, and I'm, I might say also, in following up to what Larry's saying about this address, when Tim McVeigh checked into the Dreamland Motel on Friday afternoon, April the 14th, he used this address, 3616 North Van Dyke Road in Decker, Michigan, and he listed his vehicle as a Mercury, and listed his license plate uh, number on there as well. Well, when uh, we found out that uh, Charlie Hanger had arrested a Tim McVeigh on the morning of the bombing and booked him into the Noble County Jail, of course, uh, we wanted to find out, as as I said, as much as we could about McVeigh. And when we had agents go up there, we found out that when when, uh, McVeigh was booked into Noble County Jail by Trooper Charlie Hanger, that he used this same uh, <clears throat> address in Decker, Michigan, of 3616 North Van Dyke Road. Uh, so we st- started to, to figure out this Tim McVeigh that had been at the Dreamland Motel was in all likelihood the same Tim McVeigh that was arrested by Trooper Hanger on Wednesday morning. And it just so happened that uh, Charlie Hanger arrested McVeigh uh, about 80 miles uh, north of Oklahoma City about 80 minutes after the bombing, mm. which we considered was a time and distance that was consistent with McVeigh being able to have been in Oklahoma City at the very time of the bombing, which was at 9.02. Uh, so Trooper Hanger arrested him uh, at 10.20, which was 78 minutes after the bombing at a location that was 80 miles north of Oklahoma City. So that was very interesting to us as well. And uh, we found out from taking McVeigh into custody to Noble County Jail, we also took his the clothing and other information that he had on him at the time of his arrest by hangar, and we sent all of that information to the FBI laboratory so it could be tested both chemically and other ways, and we found out that the, the genes that McVeigh had on that morning when he was arrested had PETN residue on it, which is consistent with a debt cord, detonation cord, which is used very much in the military as, in a, as a high explosive. And we also um, found out that McVeigh had a T-shirt on that morning with a picture of Abraham Lincoln on it. It says uh, Six Semper Tyrannus, which is what uh, John Wilkes Booth hollered out, shouted out at the, the uh, Ford Theater when he assassinated Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Six Semper Tyrannus means death unto tyrants. Uh, Also on this same uh, T-shirt, I'm sorry, I think I misspoke there a little bit, Jerry. The the genes had EGDN residue on them, which is water gel dynamite. The PETN residue was found on the T-shirt, and that was consistent with dead cord. They also found earplugs in his pocket. Yeah, he had earplugs in his pocket that had dynamite residue on them as well. And then the T-shirt on the back of it had a phrase from Thomas Jefferson that said the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Uh, So once we had gathered all of this information that McVeigh uh, had regarding his clothing and and other things that were in the the mercury after Charlie arresting, there was a, a but a there was a an envelope in the front seat of the car that was about a quarter to a half inch thick and. Charlie said when he arrested McVeigh, he asked him if he wanted to, him to take that envelope with him because he was afraid there might be money or some valuables in it, and he thought maybe they should take it into custody as well so that nothing would happen to it because Charlie was going to leave the, the car on the freeway there where he arrested McVeigh. And when he asked McVeigh about the envelope, McVeigh said, no, just leave it there. It'll be fine there. 
but Charlie decided to go ahead and take it into custody anyway, and it was a real gold mine as well because it had some some sayings in it that were really uh, anti-government, that were incitive type of statements, such as one of the statements was from John Locke that I'll just read it. It says, I have no reason to suppose that he who would take away my liberty would not, when he had me in his power, take away everything else, and therefore it is lawful for me to treat him as one who has put himself into a state of war against me and kill wow. him if I can, for to that hazard does he justly expose himself, whoever introduces a state of war and is aggressor in it. Uh, that was a, a statement by John Locke. There was also an, a cutout in the envelope that turned out to be from page t- 62 of a book called The Turner Diaries, which we'll talk about more later. But this statement was also very incitive in that it said, but the real value of all our attacks today lies in the psychological impact, not in the immediate casualties. More important, though, is what we taught the politicians and the bureaucrats. They learned this afternoon that not one of them is beyond our reach. They can huddle behind barbed wire and tanks in the city, or they can hide behind the concrete walls and alarm systems of their country estates, but we can still find them and kill them. That is a lesson they will not forget. So this is just some of the things that were found in this envelope that was inside McVeigh's car, and we were definitely uh, honing in on McVeigh as being involved in the Oklahoma City bombing at this time. Yeah, and Jerry, as I said earlier, all sorts of investigation was going on at uh, at the uh, Dreamland Motel, and one of the things that uh, we did out of the Kansas City office was check phone records there, and and we found a couple calls uh, from the Dreamland Motel to a on Saturday, uh, April the fifteenth to Hunan Palace, a Chinese restaurant in Junction City. So we dispatched agents to that location, and fortunately uh, this proprietor uh, had kept her documents. She keeps them in a paper bag for about 30 days at a time, and she had the uh, the receipt for an individual who ordered Mugu Gai Pan for delivery to room 25 on Saturday, uh, April the 15th. And what was interesting, the person that ordered this gave the name of Kling, K-L-I-N-G, the same name that had been used to rent the rider, rider truck, but was also the same room where Tim McVeigh was, uh, was located. So just another little indication uh, of tying uh, McVeigh to the name of Kling, uh, as well as showing some of the, uh, I, I don't know, uh, sloppiness that I think both McVeigh and Nichols uh, exhibited uh, during, uh, during this uh, crime that they, that they committed. At the same time, now we're on to barely three days later. This is April 21st. That's when McVeigh was picked up, up in Noble County. It was also when we had an address for Terry Nichols, and agents were dispatched to uh, Harrington, Kansas, to locate Terry Nichols. Initially, they set up a surveillance at uh, at, at Nichols' uh, home uh, uh, in Harrington, Kansas. Uh, he and his wife, a Filipino girl that he had gone to the Philippines and, and married, uh, and their small child uh, were observed leaving uh, the Hout residence in Terry Nichols' pickup, in his GMC pickup. Now, he went to the edge of town, and it was it was pretty certain that he had made surveillance by that time. And agents were certainly told not to lose uh, lose him, but you know, don't approach him at that at that point. Well, he goes to the Harrington Police Department or Public Safety Office, walks in, tells the uh, the local chief who his name is, Terry Nichols, and wanted to know uh, why uh, why he was being followed. Now, we later learned that Terry had known that Tim McVeigh had been arrested uh, that day and that his name and Tim McVeigh's name had been uh, blasted on the radio uh, through various media outlets, even though he had not been placed under arrest. Nichols had a choice to make that time. What was he going to try to do? Was he going to run or was he going to talk or was he going to, you know, 
meet with agents. Well, he decided that he would talk, and uh, two agents there uh, were uh, immediately uh, met with him. The first agents there were Jack Foley and Dan Jablonski, but later on, uh, Steve Smith and Scott Crabtree also joined, and they took part in the interview of Terry Nichols. And they interviewed Mr. Nichols for probably close to nine hours uh, that time. And it was very interesting uh, what Nichols had, had to say uh, in in that interview. He, he never admitted guilt uh, for the bombing, but he did provide some half-truths, some total lies, and some speculations as to uh, uh, Tim McVeigh's in- involvement. He indicated in his interview that he had uh, last seen Tim McVeigh in uh, 1994, in November of 1994, until he got a call on Easter Sunday, uh, April the uh, 16th, at his residence when he was getting sitting down to eat dinner with Mary Faye and their child. He told agents that he had received a call from Tim McVeigh, asked him to come to Oklahoma City and pick him up, that his car had broken down, and that he had a TV that uh, uh, that he Nichols had asked him to pick up uh, earlier in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, when Terry was out of the country, and uh, that he was, re- you know, if Terry wanted the TV, he could come down and pick up McVeigh. Well, in reality, w- w- what was going on? Um, now, he also told Nichols also told agents that he told McVeigh wanted him to tell Mirafay that he was not going to Oklahoma City, that he was actually going to Omaha, Nebraska. In re- reality, through phone records and uh, and other means, we we knew that. Nichols had met McVeigh since that time. They had met on the day before, actually, uh, in the Junction City, Kansas, and we have evidence to show that. And that Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh, Terry followed Tim uh, down in the Mercury, where they parked the Mercury uh, next to the YMCA uh, building, uh, which was a, a block between the bomb site and, and Tim McVeigh's car and that Terry followed him down in his pickup and then brought him back to Junction City later that night. Terry admitted that he made the trip down there. Uh, uh, He lied about the fact that he followed McVeigh uh, to Oklahoma City. Uh, So it was, we we learned a lot of valuable evidence uh, out of that interview, although again, as I said earlier, a lot of half-truths, but some of the half-truths actually provided some lead information uh, where Nichols talked about uh, renting storage sheds or having storage sheds uh, for him and McVeigh uh, that uh, they had rented back in the fall of 1994. Agents were dispatched to that uh, area and, and to the units, found out that it had been used by a, a Sean Rivers, had, the one in Harrington, Kansas, a storage shed had been rented, and uh, uh, just another alias that we had identified numerous aliases that both McVeigh and Nichols used through throughout this. Uh but uh in his statement he you know he, he provided that he did have some anti government sentiment, was upset about Waco. Uh he admitted that he had a small amounts of ammonia nitrate at his house, but he was reluctant to tell agents that because it might make him look guilty, even though we haven't definitively proved that it was an ammonia nitrate bomb at that time, even though we suspected it. Uh basically he indicated that he would buy bags of fertilizer, uh, ammonia nitrate, and then crush it into small into powder and sell it at gun shows as as plant food. He admitted he knew how to make a bomb. He he, he spoke of both the Harrington and some storage sheds that he rented in uh, Council Grove, Kansas, which is another small town near there. He admitted to the uh, you know to, to going to Oklahoma City. He admitted that he drove by the Murrah Building uh, that day. And he admitted that he had lied to his wife about where he was going, that he had told her that uh, he was going to Omaha when, uh, in fact, it, uh, he had gone to Oklahoma City. So Mr. Nichols was obviously uh, – it, it was great to have him speak to agents. He provided a lot of information that we were able to jump on, and the agents were dispatched to uh, – you know, to, to to prove, disprove some of the statements that he made and proved very valuable in preparation for trial and the conviction of uh, McVeigh and Nichols. Can, can either of you tell me 
what their connection is. You know, how did Nichols and McVeigh know each other? Yeah. Go ahead, John. Yeah, they. We found out uh, pretty quickly once we found out about Tim McVeigh, and then through Lana Padilla that they'd served in the military together. That Terry and Tim had been in the military together, and that they'd also uh, had another friend named Michael Fortier. That they'd all uh, joined the military together. Uh, received their basic training together at Fort Bragg, and that the way they joined together, that if they wanted to, they could stay together. The military promised them that they could stay together if they wanted to throughout their entire service in the military. So when they finished their their basic training at Fort Bragg, they were all three assigned uh, to Fort Riley, Kansas together, which is a Army base located just outside of Junction City, uh, Kansas, up near Manhattan, uh, Kansas. So that's how the three of them got to know each other was in the military. And they all kind of, I think, uh, not I think, we, we learned for sure that during the course of their time together in the military, they explored through conversations with each other and came to find out that they all three had kind of a bitterness and a hatred and a dislike of the federal government. And so but they, they joined the military. Fun. Pardon me? Right. But they joined the military. Yes. Kind of strange. They joined the military. Yeah. It was kind of interesting the way that they all did. All three of them, in my estimation, at, at that time, Jerry, were kind of fit in the category, if you will, of, of losers to some extent. McVeigh um, was not amounting to very much after he got out of high school. He grew up up in upstate New York, which is a rural area up there. A lot of people think of New York as all being New York City, but obviously a big part of the state of New York is rural in nature, and and McVeigh grew up around guns and hunting and things like that, and he had lived that type of environment. Terry Nichols, on the other hand, had gotten married. Him and James actually, uh, James Nichols' brothers, they actually married sisters. They married Lana Padilla and her sister, and w- the marriage was kind of falling apart, and Lana told the agents that she actually recommended to Terry that he should join the military. She thought it might be good for him, um, that it might, um, you know, give him some bearing in life, I guess. And then Michael Fortier was out in, in Arizona, also not amounting to very much, and so he joined the Army as well. And that's how they all three met each other. So you had three people who didn't have very much going on at their li- in their life at the time, that kind of banded together through their association in the military. Unfortunately, uh, that happened while they were in the service, and then when they got out, they carried on their their anti-government uh, hatred and whatnot. But like you say, it's pretty ironic, yeah, that they didn't like the government, but all three of them ended up joining the government in the military. Let me ask one other question before we move on. Mm-hmm. The report that had been broadcast about two Middle, Middle Eastern men running from the building, you know, with the uh, trench coats and white shirts, you know, was there a point that that information was put out to the public that it was false? Well, not necessarily, no, Jerry, not that it was false. Um, It just uh, continued on to be out there during the course of the investigation because there was no way you could put a report out that it was false because it's very difficult to prove a negative, to prove that something didn't happen that somebody is saying did happen. So what we did, instead of putting out a report saying that was false, because even though we were pretty darn sure it was false, Jerry, we couldn't be 100% sure it was false, again, because I say it's just very difficult to prove the negative. So that was left out there, and it was it, it continued to complicate the investigation because, as Larry mentioned earlier, uh, there were all kinds of leads that were being called in to different field offices throughout the United States. We had set up a hotline to receive calls, and there were approximately 18,000 calls that came into that hotline. And believe you me, once uh, we had the information out there about the Middle Easterners in the Brown Chevrolet pickup, we were getting calls about people seeing Middle Easterners all over in the downtown Oklahoma City area, you know, in the days, uh, minutes, weeks leading up to the bombing, and that there were reported sightings of a Brown Chevrolet truck all over downtown Oklahoma City and even in the surrounding areas of Oklahoma City. So we were being tasked with running down all of these leads, and then when you threw on top of that, 
the two composite drawings from right. Elliot's body shop, you know, leading people to believe that there were two people that went in to pick up the Ryder truck there when they rented it on, on Monday afternoon uh, before the bombing on Wednesday, it led people to believe that there were more people involved in the bombing that were still unknown. And everybody was calling in. We had people calling in saying, oh, yeah, I recognize John Doe number two. He looks like my sister's ex-boyfriend, or he looks like my ex-wife's new boyfriend. So, you know, when you have leads like that coming in with a case of this magnitude, you can't just discount them. You have to run every one of those leads to ground. So that was draining a lot of our manpower and resources off of this investigation. But we had to continue covering all of those leads because you can't leave any stone unturned when you're doing an investigation of this magnitude. You'll, you probably recall when this happened, uh, this was the largest investigation ever that had ever been conducted in the United States at that time. Yeah. So we were, we were continuing to conduct investigation in the Oklahoma City area running down all of these leads, uh, but we were also focusing in on the bomb site, uh, trying to determine with more likelihood what type of bomb would have caused this type of damage. And the bomb experts uh, all were pretty consistent on the fact that there was a lot of twisting of the metal of the bomb truck, that it was more than likely an ammonium nitrate bomb than just a straight high explosive bomb, which would have caused shear cutting of the the vehicle parts instead of the twisted nature of them. And so we were continuing to run down those leads and also then starting to try to determine what type of components would be necessary to construct a bomb of this magnitude and then start uh, continuing our investigation to see whether or not uh, McVeigh or Nichols uh, may have been involved in acquiring any of those type of bomb components. Uh, before we move into that area, I'd like to say a couple of other things about uh, some of the literature that was found in the white envelope in the front of uh, uh, McVeigh's car when he was arrested, the white envelope that was confiscated by uh, Charlie Hanger. There was a, a card in there that said, when the government fears the people, there's liberty. When the people fear the government, there's tyranny. And then down below that, in what turned out to be McVeigh's handwriting, is just a handwritten notation, maybe now there will be liberty. Uh, so mm. you can see, and Jennifer McVeigh, Tim McVeigh's sister, is the one that identified his handwriting uh, on this business card at the trials. Uh, there was also another uh, document inside the envelope that said, obey the Constitution of the United States and we won't shoot you. And then one of the most important things that was found uh, was found in Charlie Hanger's car uh, after he had arrested McVeigh, what Charlie said was that he arrested McVeigh on that weapons violation, handcuffed his hands behind his back, put him in the front seat of the patrol car, and strapped him in. Charlie said that after he arrests somebody, when he goes off duty, he always searches his patrol car before he goes back on duty to make sure that the last person he arrested didn't leave something in there unbeknownst to him. And that's what he did after the arrest of McVeigh. He searched his patrol car, and he found a wadded-up business card uh, on the back seat floorboard of his, of his patrol car right behind where McVeigh would have had his hands handcuffed behind his back. So it was obvious to us that McVeigh had this business card and didn't want to have it on him, so he watered it up and started stuffing it down in between the seats, and it fell uh, behind the front seat onto the floorboard. And it was a, a business card from Paulson's, military supply and the significance of it was that on the back of it it said uh, TNT at five dollars a stick need no. more. Oh, Call my. after one May see if I can get some more. You can see why McVeigh would not want that business card on his in on himself when he was arrested and booked into the Noble County Jail. And Jennifer McVeigh also had to identify this handwriting on this business card as being her brother's handwriting during the trial. So it was a pretty important finds. Uh, we, we just literally received a trove of evidence from Charlie Hanger's arrest of McVeigh on, on uh, Wednesday. Jerry, and speaking of troves of evidence, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to Kansas here for, for a minute. Uh, a couple things that John said were really pertinent to everyone across the country on that. We were following every lead 
eventually the evidence started taking us to you know who the real culprits were uh, eventually but that didn't stop uh, investigation going on from all these call-ins uh, and and leads that were being uh, developed one of the uh, great pieces of, of treasure trove I should say of evidence came out of Terry Nichols uh, house and uh, after the interview of, of Nichols, there was a search warrant obtained. Mr. Nichols also provided uh, consent to search his residence, but we, we obtained an, uh, a uh, search warrant uh, in addition. And some of the Larry, things that, let yes. Me say one thing before you move into that area, because you're going to move okay. into a new area there. I'd like to say okay. and follow up to what you were talking about, about the interview of Terry Nichols when when the agents were assigned to go watch Terry Nichols' house, they were told to, you know, keep an eye on him, uh, try not to let him see you, but, but the important thing is don't lose him. If he leaves, do not lose right. him. So Terry spotted the agents eventually. Uh, as, as Larry was saying, before he left, he had some ammonium nitrate in his house that he was concerned about agents finding. So he went out and started spreading that all over his yard, and one of the neighbor ladies saw him doing that. He didn't want to have custody or have that ammonium nitrate in his house uh, after he had learned that McVeigh was not had not come back from Oklahoma City. Obviously, McVeigh had been arrested. Terry was getting very concerned about that, wondering where McVeigh was because McVeigh was supposed to go back to Terry Nichols' uh, area up there after the bombing was completed on Wednesday morning, but he didn't show up. So Terry was getting very, very concerned. That's when he ran out into the yard and started uh, dispersing the re remaining part of the ammonium nitrate there that he had. And then he eventually spotted the agents and decided to leave. He no doubt was going to leave town, but the agents, as they were instructed to do, started following in him, and he noticed them following him. So he decided to go straight to the Harrington uh, Department of Public Safety and and uh, talk to the, the people there. And when he did, he said that he was being followed and that he wanted to come over there because he didn't want there to be another Waco. Mm -hmm. So obviously he was thinking about leaving town, but he got scared and went to the Department of Public Safety and turned himself in instead. And it was then that that nine-hour interview followed. And the agents that Larry uh, named there just, I think, did an outstanding job of keeping him talking uh, for that length of time. Obviously, Terry decided he was going to go in there and try to tell half-truths if he needed to, to try to cover his tracks. All of us that have been uh, in law enforcement for years and years know that when we interview people, if they have decided they're not going to tell us the truth, that it's better to keep them talking as long as you can because they're going to tell you partial truths, but sewn in those partial truths are going to be lies to cover their actions. And that's exactly what Terry Nichols did, and the agents kept him talking for nine hours. Absolutely, which got to be a real bonanza of evidence. No, absolutely. Uh, you know that that was critical, and they did they did a wonderful job in that. And, and you know Terry was trying to figure out how to save his neck at the time, and uh, so he figured sort of giving up Tim McVeigh uh, that he had suspicions, but not implicating himself was the way to do so. In the end, uh, the evidence will show that he was a full participant. For example, in his residence, uh, some of the evidence that was found was, and, and I'm sure he did not mean to have kept this, but we found a receipt for 2,000 pounds of ammonia nitrate uh, that had been obtained at Mid-Kansas Co-op in McPherson in Kansas, which is about 60 miles away, as I recall. And that purchase was on September the 30th of 1994. Investigation later at that uh, Mid-Kansas Co-op uh, determined that not only had he purchased that 2,000 pounds, he obtained an additional 2,000 pounds on October the 18th of 1994, giving him 4,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate, which was plenty enough to do the destruction uh, at the um, at the murder building. Interestingly, he used a name of Mike Havens uh, for obtaining both those purchases of ammonium nitrate. We later determined uh, through investigation of hitting every small motel basically in the state of Kansas and elsewhere between there and uh, and uh, Arizona, we determined that Terry Nichols had used the name Havens on an alias 
and checking into a motel. So another tie for him mm. uh, using that alias uh, for that. In addition to the, the receipt for ammonia nitrate, there were also some uh, rolls of uh, non-electric blasting ca- caps, uh, cord called Primadet that was found uh, in the basement of his home. That was important because an investigation determined that back in September of uh, of 1994, there had been a burglary of a quarry at Martin Marietta Quarry in Marion, Kansas. Well, at that time, Terry Nichols was working on the Donahue Ranch, a, a, a rancher there in the Marion area, and his last day of employment was on September the 30th of 1994. We also know that Tim McVeigh was in town with him and that the quarry was burglarized uh, either that night or over the next couple of days. Uh, Michael Fortier later confirmed that you know they had the explosives and uh, we determined that in, in addition to the uh, non-electric blasting caps, there were uh, 93 rolls of it stolen 544 electric blasting caps and uh, 244 sticks of Tovex, which is a a, a dynamite-like substance uh, that had been stolen and uh, from that quarry in 1994. So this kind of gives you an indication that basically they plan this bombing back in the fall or late summer, early fall of 1994. They obtained the storage sheds to place all the materials, which they did, and then they just waited because it was it was obvious that they were waiting to do this on April 19th because it had significance uh, to to both of them. Uh, in addition, and what tied further tied Terry to that uh, quarry theft was uh, in his basement was a a, a drill and uh, and drill bits uh, our. The laboratory was able to tie that drill to drilling a specific lock that was drilled into at the uh, Martin Marietta Quarry, as well as the shavings on uh, Terry's drill bit from that lock, which the sheriff of Marion, Kansas, had obtained uh, that they had left behind when they burglarized the quarry. So really a a, a significant amount of uh, evidence out of Terry Nichols' residence. In addition, there was more material concerning a calling card that uh, Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols used uh, throughout uh, their planning and conspiracy to commit this bombing. And you have to remember back in the the mid-'90s, there weren't many cell phones around. There, there, they, there weren't uh, uh, everywhere, and we had calling cards that people could. You could go to a Seven Eleven and obtain a calling card, and you know, have so many minutes that you were going to remain anonymous. No one knew who you bought that. Well, in their planning, McVeigh and Nichols uh, obtained a calling card uh, through an outfit using an alias name. Even though they thought that they remained anonymous doing this, basically they used they kept continued to pay for it with money orders, and they kept this for uh, almost a two year period, uh, and this actually gave us a great roadmap uh, as to the the contacts that they had with each other, the contacts that they had trying to obtain more uh, bomb-making materials. And I think John can add to that. It, it was a, a significant uh, trail that was followed uh, following the Bridges calling card. Do you think, John? Yeah, yeah absolutely, Gary. It was, a, it was another uh, huge, huge piece of evidence for us. The, the calling card was actually found in the search of James Nichols' residence in Decker, Michigan. And we, we uh, started tracing phone calls that were made on the calling card. You know, we've all been told in law enforcement by different phone uh, companies and whatnot that, well, we don't have those records anymore. Well, we know from doing kidnap investigations and extortion investigations and even our big drug investigations, which Larry and I have done a lot of, uh, that they do have those phone records and that they can retrieve them if the case is big enough and if it's important enough. And we were able to find out in this investigation that there were, I believe it was 685 phone calls made by uh, McVeigh and Nichols using the Bridges calling card. And we were able to find out 
uh, the location where every one of those phone calls were made from and the destination uh, phone number that it, the call was made to, as well as the time, the number of minutes that the call lasted. So it really helped us, and we used it <clears throat> uh, We used it almost like a road map in tracing where Nichols and McVeigh were at different times. And the reason that was very important to us is that it turned out that they were using this calling card to acquire the bomb components. And so whenever there was a call made, uh, we would find out, as I said, exactly where the call was made from, where it was made to, and then we would compare those phone calls to different uh, guest registration cards where McVeigh and Nichols and Michael Fortier had stayed uh, while they were acquiring the bomb components and then in the months, weeks and months leading up to the bombing. So, for example, what would happen, uh, as Larry said, we had agents... Uh, going to all of the hotels between Kingman, Arizona, where Michael Fortier had lived, all the way in through Oklahoma City and then up into Kansas, up into Harrington, Kansas, and Junction City, Kansas. And we were taking, um, having agents review all of these phone cards, I mean uh, registration cards, to see if, if they could tie any of the alias names that we were accumulating uh, during the course of the investigation, we kept a list of alias names, and the agents that were searching these motels would use that list to see if they could find any registration cards that might be of relevance to the investigation. And, for example, one of the registration cards that was found was uh, in the name of Terry Havens, and it had on it Route 2, Box 28, Hillsboro, Kansas. Well, that was a registration card that was found at the Starlight Motel, in Salina, Kansas, which is not too far from uh, the Mid-Kansas Co-op uh, in McPherson, Kansas. So, and you remember that the uh, fertilizer purchases were made in the name of Mike Havens. So this registration card in the name of Terry Havens with Route 2, Box 28, was pretty important find, especially when the handwriting on the card was determined by Lana Padilla to be identical to Terry Nichols' handwriting, and there were uh, fingerprints found on this card belonging to Terry Nichols using the name Terry Havens. So what we started doing, Jerry, we started using these registration cards and the information that was contained on them, uh, such as addresses, and on this particular one that I've been talking about from the Starlight Motel was a variation of Terry Nichols' license plate. Uh, WX1640, uh, I believe it was, something like that, but it's a variation right. of Terry Nichols' Michigan license plate. So we used these registration cards, handwriting that was on them, fingerprints that were on them, and we were coupled with the Daryl Bridges calling card, we were able to place uh, Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh at locations where bomb components were being acquired. As Larry said, it was important for us uh, to start following the evidence, and that's exactly what we did here. We knew that the ingredients for an ammonium nitrate uh, bomb consisted of certain things. One would be the bomb truck, which we found the Ryder truck and determined that it was actually the bomb vehicle that had been rented in the name of Robert Kling. But then, as Larry said, we we captured McVeigh at the Dreamland Motel uh, using that name Kling when he placed an order for that uh, Mugu Gai Pan uh, Chinese food. So we had the bomb component, I mean the bomb truck tied to him. We now have, had been able to then tie the ammonium nitrate purchases to McVeigh and Nichols through the use of their names and the names that Terry was using at hotels. Uh, we were able to tie them to the uh, burglary of the water gel dynamite Tovex and the blasting caps from the Martin Marietta burglary from that drill uh, and the drill bits that were found in Terry Nichols' house. Larry, do you remember the fellow's name that did that comparison for us on the drill bit? I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank also, sorry. It might come to us a little bit later, but anyway... When he did that comparison, it was almost like a ballistics test when he lined up the drill bit, the markings from the drill bit that were found at Terry Nichols' house to a padlock that was drilled at the Mark Marietta burglary. When he took the, the markings from 
that drill bit and from that drill uh, from the lock that had been drilled, they matched up perfectly. So we were able to tie uh, Terry Nichols to the Mark Marietta burglary in that fashion, and then. So now we have Nichols and McVeigh with the bomb truck, with the ammonium nitrate, with the water gel dynamite, and the blasting caps. And we continued doing that uh, using the Daryl Bridges calling card until we were able to tie them together with all of the bomb components that were needed to make an ammonium nitrate bomb. And the the last time this uh, phone card was used was the night before the bombing when uh, Terry communicated from Kansas City, Missouri to Tim McVeigh uh, at the uh, at the Dreamland Motel on April 17th. Uh, that's the last use of that card, and we know that they were uh, finalizing their plans uh, and agreeing, and they mixed the bomb uh, actually on, on uh, the day before the bombing uh, at a small lake between Harrington, Kansas, and Junction City, Kansas. We have witnesses that saw a rider truck and a vehicle fitting Terry Nichols' description uh, at that location, and that's where they actually mixed the bomb on April the 18th, the day prior to the bombing. And how do you mix the bomb, um, if you can explain what that means? Well, in, in this instance, they had a number of – they had. we had also uh, been uh, – uh, finding phone calls, and we found in Terry Nichols' residence a couple of barrels. But basically, they placed the barrels in the rider truck, and uh, Lori Fortier, Michael Fortier's wife, had described, and before a jury, how she had sat down uh, with Tim McVeigh, and he lined up soup cans uh, to, to, to provide the, the perfect shape for to get the maximum destruction uh, out of the bomb. So uh, they lined the barrels up in the truck. They poured the ammonium nitrate. They placed the Tovex sausages uh, inside uh, the barrels with the Tovex sausages. They connected the blasting caps to this, and they needed one more ingredient. I think John can give you a, a good theory on and that was... Uh, an igniter, uh, and they needed racing fuel to pour over the ammonia nitrate. You want to tell them about that, John? Yeah, we had most of the bomb components uh, tied back to McVeigh and Nichols by this time, but as I mentioned, we were using that Bridges calling card to track locations where McVeigh and Nichols had made phone calls from. And one of the locations that we found uh, a phone call made using the calling card was from uh, the Amish Inn Hotel in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. So we wanted to have agents go by the Amish Inn and see if they could find any registration cards that tied back that we could tie back to McVeigh or Nichols or Michael Fortier, for that matter, since we knew there had been a Bridges calling card made from that location uh, on the, the evening of October the 20th, 1994. So when agents went to the hotel, they, they did find a... Uh, uh, registration card there in the name, I believe that one was in the name of Joe Call, if my memory serves me correctly. I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. Also had uh, a variation of Nichols' license plate for his pickup truck there uh, on the registration card, and there were also fingerprints found on that registration card as well that belonged to Terry Nichols. And we had tied uh, Terry Nichols to the name Joe Call previously through his rental of storage sheds in Council Grove, Kansas. So we knew that Terry Nichols had stayed at this hotel on the evening of October the 20th and in all likelihood had his a blue Chevy truck with a white camper top there with him. So <clears throat> we then found out that there was a purchase of three barrels of nitro, 55-gallon drums of nitromethane made from a, 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 tr a race that called BP uh, Racing Fuels. The purchase was made from uh, one of their employees, uh, in Ennis, Texas, on October the 21st, 1994, which was the day after we had Terry Nichols registered at the Amish Inn in Paul's Valley. Well, the Amish Inn in Paul's Valley is exactly in the middle on the route from uh, Harrington, Kansas, down to Ennis, Texas. And the person at uh, Ennis, Texas that sold the racing fuel uh, down there said that he remembered the sale because it was such an unusual sale at a racetrack. He said, usually I might sell a gallon, maybe two gallons of nitromethane at a racetrack because it's really a high-powered fuel that race drivers use in their race cars. 
uh, it's, it's very explosive in its nature. And he said it was just so unusual to sell 53, 55-gallon drums of that for cash at a racetrack that I'll, he said, I'll always remember. And he described the person that purchased it as kind of uh, having a face that resembled a possum because his nose kind of hung down. And he said, he, he said, I just thought of him as looking like a possum when he bought it. And he identified uh, McVeigh in the courtroom with 90% certainty that, that that was the person that he sold the racing fuel to at the racetrack. So now we had Nichols and McVeigh also tied to the nitromethane, which was what they need. You asked about how they mixed the bomb, and Larry told you about Michael Fortier, uh, his wife, Lori, saying that when she was there by herself with McVeigh, that he took soup cans out of her kitchen cabinet and put them down on the floor and lined them up into what he called a shape charge, which is a military term that's used uh, uh, to decide or determine which way the explosive is actually going to detonate towards. In other words, McVeigh told Lori that he was going to put the barrels in the back of the truck like those soup cans in a shape that would aim the entire bomb blast at the Murrah building. And so that's what they did. When they mixed the bomb, they, they got the barrels and they put the ammonium nitrate that they'd acquired in the barrels and then they put the Tovex dynamite in there they cut slits, I think, in the Tovex dynamite, and they put those Primadep blasting caps and buried those into the Tovex, and then they put the nitromethane, they dumped all the barrels of nitromethane into those respective barrels that they were going to use in the bomb blast, and then they tied all of that together with the debt cord. You remember that we talked about McVeigh having EGDN, which is dynamite, water gel dynamite, on his jeans and on his earplugs, when he was arrested, and that he also had PETN, which is debt cord, uh, on his T-shirt. Uh, so there was no doubt that we had tied him substantially to the bombing and to the blast, and we uh, tied Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh substantially to acquiring all of the bomb components. So the only thing left that they needed, Jerry, uh, after they got the bomb mixed at Gary Lake on Tuesday morning, was <clears throat> they needed uh, some type of device to to uh, set the bomb blast off, as Larry was mentioning earlier in this conversation about lighting the fuse. That's what McVeigh did. He had tied all the barrels together, him and Terry Nichols, with the dead cord so that it would explode simultaneously and they could get the bomb, the, the highest impact of the bomb headed towards the Murrah building. And when McVeigh uh, pulled the bomb truck up in front of that Regency Tower Apartments a block and a half away from the Murrah building on Wednesday morning at 8.57. All he needed to do then was ignite the fuse that was leading from the cab of the truck back into the, to the bed of the, to the box of the truck to ignite the bomb. And that's what he did when he pulled away at 8.57. That's the last time we had him on video in front of, in the rider truck in front of, not, not McVeigh himself. We never had him on video. But we had the bomb truck on video at 8:57, uh, pulling away from the uh, the front of the Regency Tower Apartments over to a location that was down uh, in a cutout in front of the Murrah Building. You couldn't see into the windows, so that's why you couldn't tell who was driving it. Yeah, you couldn't see him when he left the vehicle. No what video is- of that. When oh, at, I see. At, okay. This is only okay. a couple blocks before he got there. There was no video of the truck pulling in front of the Murrah building. So when he exited the truck, there was no video of him. Now, I will say this, that when Michael Fortier started cooperating, he told us exactly what was going to happen, that he and McVeigh had taken a trip through Oklahoma City and that McVeigh told him exactly on the way how he was going to uh, blow up the, the Murrah building. He said he was going to use the Ryder truck, and when they saw a Ryder truck drive by, he said, that's exactly the size truck of Ryder truck I'm going to get right there to do the bomb in, and then he, he said when we got down into Oklahoma City, McVeigh wanted to turn off and go show me the building he was going to blow up, and we were going to kind of talk about his escape route and stuff once he planted the rider truck in front of the Murrah building. And what Fortier told us was he said he was going to run through a parking lot immediately to the north of the Murrah building and then turn east down an alleyway behind the YMCA because he was going to park his getaway car over a little bit farther to the east of the YMCA building. And you remember that I mentioned that we found that truck, the key that belonged to the truck 
behind the YMCA building in the exact path that Fortier told us that McVeigh was going to make his escape route. Another thing that was interesting, Jerry, that that we did was we had a Ford Motor Company, once we had found that key and and we felt like it was probably the key to the bomb truck, we asked Ford Motor Company if they would make a new ignition uh, for that exact same 1993 um, Ford truck that turned out to be the bomb truck so we could see if that key worked with that ignition, and it did. I guess he probably forgot. It would have made more sense just to leave the key in the vehicle when he left instead of taking it with him. He should have left the key in the vehicle, just left it running and locked the doors when he got out. But I think he forgot in his adrenaline that was going, he forgot that he had it. And I personally think that uh, when he took off running, he realized when he got over behind the YMCA building that he had still had the key in his hand, threw it away at that point in time, or when the bomb blast went off, that it rattled him and he dropped the key at that point in time. There's no doubt that that's what happened, that he dropped it behind the the YMCA building. We know that. There's no doubt about that. Another thing I'll say that Ford Motor Company did for us, uh, they went and purchased the the truck that was made immediately in, in succession with the bomb truck. The one, Larry, do you remember it was either the truck that was purchased, that was manufactured either before or after? one serial number after the uh, the bomb truck was made was after. yeah that's right they, they, the, the they next vehicle that truck for us uh, Jerry so that we could use components of that truck to put together in the courtroom based on pieces of the truck that we found in the in the search around the Murrah building because there was a lot of there was a lot of talk going on because of the the witness that saw the two middle easterners in in the Chevy truck and then the confusion at Elliot's body shop uh, about whether there was one or two people that went in there, there was also a lot of confusion then about, well, was there one or two trucks? So th- all of the pieces of the truck that we found were consistent with there only being one truck. There was not any duplicate truck part that we found that would have indicated there was two trucks. Larry, you might want to go back uh, and talk a little bit about John Doe number 2, what you guys did when we were trying to identify John Doe number 2. To sort of wrap some things up, you know, uh, we talked a lot about John Doe 1 and John Doe 2. Uh, There was an extensive amount of investigation done trying to identify John Doe 2, including uh, reviewing all rider truck rentals uh, in the area for the days before and after uh, the bombing. And what we determined that one day – After McVeigh had uh, rented the uh, Ryder truck, there had been two soldiers that had come in and rented another Ryder truck. One of them generally fit the description of Tim McVeigh, and the other one was identical to John Doe, too, especially the hat. After an extensive amount of investigation, it was determined, and our witness eventually agreed and testified to the fact, that he had confuse the two incidents. So a a soldier uh, by the name of Todd Bunning, who was wearing the the hat with the scallops on it, uh, was there uh, a day different from when Tim McVeigh uh, picked up the uh, uh, Ryder truck. He had absolutely nothing to do with the bombing, and investigation and evidence points that it was Tim McVeigh, Terry Nichols, with some knowledge and some assistance from Michael Fortier that carried out uh, this bombing. One of the things, too, Jerry, that we learned when we found out who Todd Bunning was, the witnesses had described Todd Bunning, or Tom Kessinger had anyway, as having on a black T-shirt. To set the stage here just a little bit, Tom Kessinger used to like to go in and take his morning and afternoon breaks. He was a mechanic. They had a body shop also at, at uh, where the truck was rented from at Elliott's Body Shop, and Tom was a a mechanic back there, and he used to like to go up to the front office. I think he liked to go up and visit with Vicki Beamer. She was kind of a cute lady. I think he liked to go visit with her, and he'd he'd take his morning and afternoon breaks up there. He'd get him a bag of popcorn and a Coke and sit up there, and that's why he was up there in the office when Tim McVeigh came in and rented the Ryder truck, and he was also there when these two other individuals, the soldiers, came in on Tuesday afternoon a day later and right. rented their rider truck. That was Michael Hertig and and Todd uh, Bunting. Well, <clears throat> Kessinger said that when he saw 
uh, the, the person he described as John Doe number one, he said that guy was uh, with a second person who he described as being about five foot ten and 200 pounds, real muscular build, dark complexion. But he said he had on a, a, a hat that was like a Carolina Panthers uh, football cap. He said that uh, when when he looked at the guy, he noticed that he had a little piece of a tattoo protruding from of the black T-shirt he was wearing, and he said it, it, it reminded him of, he thought it was one of those uh, Playboy Bunny uh, tattoos. And when we, found, when we finally caught up with Todd Bunning and he put on a black T-shirt, he had a little edge of a Playboy uh, Bunny tattoo protruding down from the arm of that T-shirt. And he said that he also had a Carolina Panthers uh, football cap uh, so we were certain at that point in time that we had John Doe number two and that it was Todd Bunning who had absolutely nothing to do with the Oklahoma City bombing. And Tom Kessinger simply did a disassociation of witnesses and that he put John Doe number two, who turned out to be Todd Bunning, in with McVeigh instead of being with Michael Hurdy. So he accurately described exactly what he had seen and he did a very good job of the composite drawings of John Doe number one and number two as being Tim McVeigh and Todd Bunning. He just simply took Todd Bunning out of the transaction with Michael Hurdig and put him in with the transaction with, with uh, Tim McVeigh renting the truck the day before. Jerry, this caused a lot of investigation regarding John Doe too, and I mean it was exhaustive the things that were covered uh, on uh, on John Doe two and John Doe one, and and frankly it still leads to a lot of the conspiracy theories that are still out there regarding the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, you know this belief in John Doe two, and there were others involved. But investigation and the evidence pointed to, to the uh, three gentlemen that I mentioned, you know, Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols with some assistance from Michael Fortier. Larry and John, this is absolutely fascinating, but we're getting kind of long. Can we stop now and then do a part two? I'd love to know a lot more about Terry Nichols and Timothy McVeigh, who they are and and all this planning that they did. I'd love to also get an understanding from you about whether they were sloppy or this was kind of divine intervention because the way this came together so quickly is just amazing to me. Can we stop now and then start back up again next week? Absolutely, Jerry. Uh, this is Larry. My pleasure. Uh, it, it is a. It's a, not an easy tale to, to say in, in an hour and a half. There, there was a lot of investigation involved in this matter. Sure, Jerry. That'll that'll be fine. This is John. Uh, one of the good things about talking to Larry and I is that we know the case so well. The other thing is is that we know it so well, uh, we we in, enjoy talking about all of it. When I call you again next week, is there something else that we'll be able to look forward to hearing about? I think, Jerry, as you mentioned, uh, some of the things about the personalities are very interesting to, to folks, I think, to see how somebody could get so far reduced in their life that they could do something as horrific as a crime of this nature, I think is very interesting. And, and yeah, some of the victim uh, stories are, are pretty interesting. Uh, we had several of them testify at the trial, and, and so we could talk a little bit about that if you, if you think your listeners would be interested in that as well. Yeah, I, I definitely think that we should spend some time talking about the lives that were lost. Let's sure, do we that. can do that. Certainly. And that's the end of part one of this interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, I have photos of Larry and John, and there are links to FBI overviews about the Oklahoma City bombing and some really great videos featured during the 20th anniversary two years ago. There are also newspaper links to timelines about the investigation. If you enjoyed the interview, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you. At the bottom of the episode show notes, you'll find all the social media share buttons. This week, we'll skip the crime fiction recommendation, other than, of course, my own crime novel, Pay to Play, available at Amazon.com. Just want to remind you that the FBI reading resource with pay to play and all of the FBI crime fiction, true crime and memoirs written by the FBI agents featured on this podcast is available when you sign up for my newsletter. The newsletter is sent out once a month. 
in it. I make it easy for you to review episode show notes, photos, crime recommendations, and I provide updates on the FBI in books, TV, and movies, and my own author journey. So I invite you to subscribe to my monthly newsletter. And I also invite you to review FBI Retired Case File Review on iTunes. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again soon for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.